In chapter 15, we're going to introduce the basics of rest. The obvious starting point is to answer the question, what is rest? It's surprisingly hard to give a clear answer to that because it's not a standard. So it can mean different things to different people. I will do my best to give the most definitive answer I can. For me, rest is based on four core principles, or if you prefer, key features. It's going to take us the next 10 chapters or so to explore all four of them, but in this chapter, we'll meet the first two. And they are representations and URIs. These are the fundamental building blocks of rest, and I'll explain what they're about. Now, it would be wrong to say that SOAP was a failure. It isn't. SOAP has been very successful. It's used on projects all over the world, and it's still in very heavy use today. It's just that SOAP definitely has imperfections, and it's arguable that REST has become popular as a response to that. So for that reason, I'm going to start our discussion of REST by recapping SOAP, and that will sort of give me something to work against. Now, I don't know if you've come straight to this chapter, so you might not know anything about SOAP, but the very high level concepts of SOAP are that we, first of all, have a URL locating a WSDL, the Web Service Definition Language. That's a document that our client will access using a standard HTTP GET, and it contains full details of the web service, in particular the operations that the service supports, and a full definition of the messages that can be sent and received. It is effectively a specification of the web service. Once our clients obtained the WSDL, there is one further URL, and it's actually contained inside the WSDL. This is sometimes called the endpoint of the web service. And actually, this URL is used for all further requests. Everything that the client wants to do with our web service will be done through this single URL. So if, for example, we want to run this get all customers operation, then we're going to make a request to the URL that you can see here. Now, interestingly, in SOAP, this request is always going to be a POST request, and it's just part of the standard. So already, you might be able to see one of the reasons why SOAP can feel unwieldy. We know from standard HTTP definitions that POST should denote an operation that is not safe to repeat. But our GET ALL customers is perfectly safe to repeat. But the client developer won't be able to tell just by looking at the WSDL that get all customers is safe to repeat. I mean, they can probably guess by the name, but there's nothing in the specification to say that it is an idempotent operation. So I guess we'd need to check in some kind of reference manual to determine if the results of a call to get all customers could be safely cached, or if we could repeat the call, or whatever. Now, let me be clear, I'm not a critic of SOAP. I use SOAP and I use it perfectly successfully. And it's always a difficult thing with courses like this where we have to compare and contrast different ways of doing things that I might sound like a, a zealous critic of SOAP. I'm really not. But it is difficult to talk about REST-based web services without referring to SOAP. So as I'm amongst friends here, I hope you won't get too upset with me making comparisons. And as I'm sure you're aware, there are a lot of angry debates in the industry, and I don't really find that helpful. I'll be honest that I prefer REST-based web services, but I think SOAP-based web services do have their place. Before we go any further, I should say what the advantages of SOAP are over using REST-based web services. The, the big one for SOAP for me would be that we have this WSDL from which we can generate a lot of code. If you're working with a relatively simple web service, then it can be really quite luxurious to use a SOAP-based web service because it basically boils down ju just to making method calls on generated classes. You're going to find with REST, there's generally a lot more work to do, but I hope to prove 
in the forthcoming chapters that REST has a lot of advantages. So let's start then by answering the question, what is REST? Well, answering that question isn't easy because while SOAP is a standard specification, it's a protocol, and I can point you to a formal definition of SOAP, there is in fact no formal definition of REST. It's not a standard, it's not a protocol. And if you were to show me any REST-based web service on the planet, there's no way that I can assess it against any kind of verifiable standard. So it's a bit hard to pin down really, but I'll try to describe it by starting with the website you can see here. It's got a slightly awkward URL, but actually I've just Googled for Roy Fielding thesis. Now Roy Fielding was one of the chief contributors to the architecture of the World Wide Web. He worked on the HTTP standard and many of the ideas that we were talking about in the previous chapter about HTTP verbs came directly from Roy Fielding. Now in the year 2000, so in other words, well after the web had become very successful, Roy was aiming to get a doctorate. So he had to write a dissertation. And the website you can see here is that exact dissertation. And what he decided to do very roughly was to base his thesis around the decisions that he and his colleagues had made when deciding what the high level architecture of the World Wide Web should be. Well, actually, and if you were to read the document for yourself, you'll see that the thesis is at a very high level, is really talking about general architectures of general network based systems. But really, and I'm, I'm being very rough here, and I don't think he'd thank me for this, but very roughly, I would say this thesis contains a distillation of all of the best practices that they'd followed when architecting the World Wide Web. Now, it's quite a heavy read, this document. You'll, you'll see a lot of people on the web claiming that this is a, a very readable PhD thesis. And I think, to be fair, it probably is readable for a PhD thesis, but it's certainly not light reading. My job here is to give you a good summary of this document. It's important to remember, I think, that this document doesn't mention web services at all. It wasn't Roy's intention to define what a good web service should look like. He's talking here about the architecture of any distributed system. But as I say, all of the knowledge in this thesis really came from the web. And as you know, the web was a massive success. Definitely the most successful network based architecture of all time. So the idea is that this thesis is almost a distillation of all the things that the web got right. So you don't need to read that document, but we're going to summarize the major aspects of this architectural style that is called REST. One of the chapters, it's chapter five, is where he defines the term REST. And I think I would describe REST as being his definition of the key features that are well-designed distributed architecture should have. Key feature number one is what he called representations. Now REST talks a lot about resources. Now, resources are just really things that our application cares about. They are, if you like, the nouns in our application. Now I'll be more specific about what that means later, but I hope you get the general flavor of that. For a concrete example, in our application, a customer would be an obvious resource. Now, we're going to need to send data about these customers to and from the server. In SOAP, you might remember that we used XSDs and WSDLs to define kind of messages, which would be a very similar concept to this. But in REST, it is done by using so-called representations. And all a representation is, it's almost too simple to explain really, is it's a serialized form of the resource. In other words, we're going to be able to convert our resource into some kind of format that we can use to transfer to and from the server. 
And in practical terms, often it's some kind of readable form. Now, REST isn't specific about what the format should be, but in practice, we just use some kind of standard format for our representations. For example, we could perfectly well use XML for a representation, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. Very similar, I guess, to the concept of a SOAP message. The crucial difference, I think, would be that the representation is only containing data about a resource in our system. There's no reference to any operations inside a representation. So here I just have my customer ID, my customer name, and so on. So there's no rules about the format though. I've used XML here, but it could be any of the other standard formats such as JSON. It could be a binary format. It could really be anything. Now, by the way, this key feature is the very reason that REST has its name. The phrase REST stands for Representational State Transfer. And really all that's saying is that we have these representations and their obvious use is to allow us to transfer state from one computer to another. For us, that's going to be the client communicating to the server. Now on this particular caption, I've said that's HTTP, but actually remember REST is just a general concept you could apply this to any network-based protocol. It doesn't have to be HTTP, but for practical purposes, we almost always apply REST to HTTP. So from this point on, I'm going to continue to make that assumption. So we have representations and we're going to use it to transfer state from, in our case, the client to and from the server. Now you might be wondering, how does the client know what format of data it's going to receive from our web service? It might be that we've written our web service to return XML, but the client would prefer to work with JSON. Well, actually, that's quite an important concept in REST, and we're going to use something called content negotiation there, but I've decided for simplicity to not make that a key feature. So we're going to return to that later, but I wanted to mention it here just in case it's bothering you in any way. I think just to keep things simple for now, just assume that we're always going to return a specific type of data as a representation, and we'll modify that later. The second key feature of a REST-based architecture is that we're going to have unique identifiers for all of our resources. Now again, pure REST is just an architectural style, and it doesn't specify exactly what the format of these identifiers should be. But again, we're going to assume that we are working from HTTP, so we can reuse one of the big concepts that you're very familiar with in HTTP, and that is URLs. Well, actually, the REST documentation refers to them as URIs. And if you don't mind, I'm going to digress for a moment and talk about the difference between URIs and URLs. Now, I must admit, this is a really complex and, and I think quite tedious distinction. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. For the rest of this course, I will probably use both terms interchangeably. But just in case you do want to know, a URI is a uniform resource identifier. For uniform, just basically think of that as being unique. It's a method for creating unique identifiers for a resource. So for example, on our system, you are now familiar with the representations and the resources. So we have a resource here, which is resource 102. That's a, our customer called Jim Long. And we might decide that we're going to issue this resource with the uniform resource identifier of forward slash customer forward slash 102. Now you're going to see before long that URI design is a really important aspect of designing a REST-based web service. URL, which is probably the term that you're more familiar with using, is technically called a uniform resource locator. 
And the way I think of the difference between URL and URI is that a URL will contain information about where that resource can actually be found. So although I have here the resource identifier customer slash 102, when I want to use this in practice, I'm going to need to use the URL, which will be something like www.virtualpairprograms.com forward slash web service forward slash customer forward slash 102. So I guess the URL is a more specific form of the URI or the URL is a more practical form of the URI. As I've said, there's a lot of confusion about that distinction. I'm not sure that it really matters in the end, but certainly if you read Roy's thesis, or actually if you read any of the literature about REST web services, you'll see a lot of references to URIs. So I'll try to be as consistent as I can through this course. So then key feature number two then is that all of our resources are going to have their own unique identifiers and we're going to use standard URLs to achieve that. Now think about it, that's quite a simple idea but a big big difference from SOAP. On a SOAP web service we have essentially two URLs, one for the WSDL and one for the actual endpoint and that basically means all of the operations on the web service, two URLs. On a REST based web service we're going to have potentially, well, really an unbounded number of URLs. And so designing clear and understandable URLs is going to be one of the most, most important parts of our API. I think the hardest thing about getting started with REST is getting a grasp on what it actually is. Obviously, it's going to allow us to build a web service somehow, but who's in charge of the REST standards and how do we know how to build a correct web service? Well, we can't. It's a loose collection of ideas inspired by a PhD thesis from the year 2000, which can make it quite hard to pin down exactly what it is. This course attempts to show you all of the practices that the best REST web developers follow. I claim that a good REST web service follows four core ideas, or key features as I call them here. The first two of them are representations and URIs. The other two, well, we'll meet them later in the course, but I don't want to talk on and on for hours without doing any programming. So in the next chapter, we'll put the first two features into action when we will use Spring support for REST to build some representations and we'll give them URIs.